Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos, Ladies and gentlemen, a and good evening to you all following us on social, social networks, on Facebook, Facebook, where this webinar is currently being streamed on the French channel. You can also listen to interpretation in Polish, English, Spanish or German by using the link you have on Zoom and that is in comment here. Don't hesitate to put forward your questions on the chat if you're on Zoom or in comments if you're on social networks. After the first speeches, we will have a Q&A where the different speakers will answer your uh, questions. For one job created in e-commerce, six are being destroyed in small businesses. Welcome to this webinar called Amazon European Job, we job Killer. Before starting and giving the floor to the different speakers, I wanted to give you a few words on the context pushing us to carry out an investigation on the impacts of e-commerce on employment. Amazon is taking advantage of the crisis. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the profits of Amazon have exploded. If we compare the situation of Amazon uh, compared to last year, its profits doubled. They took advantage of the crisis. Jeff Bezos, the boss of Amazon, is the world's wealthiest man. Of course, he is uh, in big rivalry with Elon Musk. And I do think that currently Jeff Bezos is uh, number one in terms of wealth in our world. So many people were able to um, profit from the pandemic and some others are struggling, including small businesses, local businesses. They were forced, forced to close because of the lockdown, because of the curfew, because of political decisions. They are struggling. What we have been able to see is that they are no contesting this situation. They are contesting, protesting also against Amazon. Since the beginning of the pandemic, profits exploded for Amazon, but so did the protestation against Amazon. More and more people are protesting against Amazon. People are protesting against Amazon because it is not paying taxes. It is frauding VAT taxes as well. It is not really dignified at a time where everyone needs to show solidarity, where everyone is struggling to make ends meet, where we realize that public services are key, so that, such as hospitals and therefore public money in order to fund those public services. Therefore, protestations against Amazon uh, gained many sectors that were previously not really interested in that. And uh, no workers in the different Amazon workers are also uh, fighting back. And I would like to emphasize this because this is my, uh, my starting point in the fight against Amazon. Let's go back one year ago. We have the first speech of the French president of uh, the French president saying that only essential activities should be carried out and that we should respect social distancing. At the same time, trade unions in Amazon tell me, well, we do not really understand the current situation. We heard Macron, but uh, we, uh, day in, day out, send things that are not really essential. We ship things that are not really essential. Um, we work while not respecting the social distancing measures without any alcoholic gels. And as the uh, demand is exploding at Amazon, we are even more working than previously. Therefore, those workers decided to file a complaint against the management of Amazon France. They will win that battle and it will be a kickstart of a big momentum elsewhere in Europe. At this time, I decided to organize an international hearing of the Amazon workers working in different warehouses outside of France. I wanted to ask them what they were experiencing, if they were in the same situation as in France. 
I'm organizing this hearing with my colleague Maria Arena. She was taking part to that webinar. She is an MEP uh, from Spain. And what we see is that while they speak different languages, they have the same message. They let us know that working organization at Amazon is created in such a way as to avoid collective organization and trade unionization. Warehouse work is marked by pressure for productivity. The management is based on constant control, timekeeping of every move of the workers, blackmailing of the workers in order to avoid any kind of collective organization of workers. It is just about controlling the workers at Amazon. Last week, you might have heard that Amazon in the US decided to put um, CCTVs in all trucks of, of delivery drivers to monitor them. So Amazon is controlling its workers and a few weeks later in September 2020, the trade union Uniglobal told me that Amazon decided to go even further in that control rationale. It is no spying. Amazon published and then withdrawn. It published two job, job offers. It was actually looking for spies to spy on workers and political leaders. I then decided to send a letter to Jeff Bezos that is co-signed by 37 MEPs to explain this gentleman that in Europe we have rules, democracy rules and rules on trade union freedoms and that these cannot be trapped, that these cannot be violated and that he has to respect workers. A few weeks later, I'm confirmed in my worries because there is an article published in Vice, an American newspaper, having access to leaked documents saying that Amazon indeed tried to spy on social movements workers. And Vice also explains that in France in 2019, there was a movement of yellow vests and we have many notes at Amazon explaining the relationship uh, some workers at Amazon could have with the Yellow Vest movement. So this protest against Amazon is growing up. Mobilization has been exacerbated. They take place at every level, at every scale, at the local level against the, um, the creation of warehouses and at the international level. To explain that, we have Alma Dufour. She is in charge of Amazon at the Association Friends of the Earth, and she is actually one of the staunch opponents of Amazon in France. She will explain about the French situation at the international level, mobilization is also organizing with the uni global trade union it is also taking part to the mobilization against amazon and i thank nick rudikov who is one of our speakers today he will talk about the international mobilization against amazon the only argument amazon could put forward and it leads us back to our study the only argument is that well, you can criticize us, but we at Amazon, we are creating jobs. Amazon, wherever it goes in the world, it goes in deindustrialized regions, in areas where unemployment is really high. Amazon is then saying, we are bringing jobs to you. We wanted to know whether it was true. We wanted to know what was the real impact of Amazon on jobs. And guess what? Well, in this study, the study I'm showing you, e-commerce, and it is going to be presented by the two economists um, that uh, created it, and it's not real. It's actually destroying jobs. Amazon is destroying jobs and is also offering undignified jobs. So, without further ado, let me conclude by saying that on 
uh, deteriorated jobs conditions, we are lucky enough uh, to have among us Magda Maninovska with us. She is a worker at Amazon and she took part to hearings. She explained uh, how, the situ how the work is organized in Poland. And she will, of course, explain how work is organized there. And she will explain how Amazon is a job killer in the way in which that it is actually deteriorating the job quality. I will now give the floor to Anno Kuanatan and Florence Muradian, the two economists who drafted the study. I won't be any, uh, I won't talk any longer. I will give them the floor because they will explain how Amazon has an impact on economy. Thank you. Good evening to everyone and thank you Leila for organizing this study and thank you also uh, for allowing us today to uh, present the main results of that study. First of all, as Leila said, it is an independent study and we followed uh, the scientific rigor to um, draft it. The first observation is that e-commerce is relentlessly growing in Europe. Estimates vary from one institute to another. Eurostat estimates that uh, it is worth 150 billion euros. Some other institutes said, says that it is rather worth 600 billion euros. So it is quite an important market indeed. So, whatever the debate on the size of the market, what is certain is that this market is growing. Whatever the estimates, it doubled or even trebled since 2013. And it can also be um, observed in the uh, purchasing behavior, the consumption behavior. We uh, had a look at the consumption patterns of consumers during the 12 last months and we do realize that in many European countries um, that the share of e-commerce is increasing whatever the age of consumers the age groups you can see that uh, on the on the slide here the small dots are data dating back from 2013 because we had not uh, more recent data for those. Unfortunately, the study could not be realized with post-COVID data because, uh, and it's a shame because e-commerce boomed during this period. Indeed, consumers had no choice. They had to buy online. And Florence is going to get back on this a bit later. She is going to uh, allude to the, the further impact in the following years of e-commerce. What you need to keep in mind is that our study is uh, focusing on the situation before the COVID-19 crisis. How did we work? One of the argument of uh, stakeholders in the e-commerce is that they are creating jobs. We tend to see that employment is growing, but there is a but. Employment can indeed increase because of some economic factors, or because of demographic growth as well. But there can be also other factors that are detrimental to employment. So we used an economic model that helps um, dissociate those factors. So there are economic factors promoting jobs, such as the economic growth and demographic growth. And then we add e-commerce to it in order to isolate the real impact on employment. So the real question is, what's happening on employment in European countries when, when consumers are buying more and more online. 
we had a look at the results and as you can see we realized that there are quite huge differences depending on the countries. What you see on this table with the different countries is called elasticity. It is the impact on employment when you have one extra percentage point of online consumption. What is the impact on, em on employment? If you have one point of consumption uh, add one additional point of consumption online in France, it re reduces employment in the um, in shops by 0.2%. In some countries, the impact is slightly positive or even uh, really positive. For Italy, for example, Italy is quite a peculiar case because Italy is lagging behind compared to other European countries. A previous study carried out on European countries showed a neutral or a positive impact. What we see is that as soon as e-commerce is getting mature in countries such as France, Germany and Spain, the three biggest markets in the European Union for e-commerce, by the way, the impact is negative. Other piece of information on top of those differences from one country to another is that company are not equal in their competition with e-commerce. It's not really surprising and it is scientifically proven now. The elasticity is negative for uh, small businesses or SMEs for micro companies, it is even more detrimental. Even for companies of a middle size up until 249 employees, the impact is negative. When the impact is getting positive is where we have a comp bigger companies, more than 250 employees. So this is a negative impact, negative impact in countries where e-commerce is quite mature. This is a macro vision of the situation at the country level. It is also timely to have a look at the company size. And it is also important to have a look at the different sectors. That is what we did in detail and Florence is going to explain uh, what are what were the results we got for a very specific country, uh, France. Based on the numbers we estimated and Arno just presented, we were able to estimate the number of employments that were destroyed or created by the development of e-commerce during the period 2009 to 2018. The result is that the loss was 114,000 employment in non-food retail sector. That is 17% of the uh, personnel in that sector in 2018. As you can see on the table here on the slide, one of the main points in point in the study is that those losses are differing from one category to another in the retail sector, but also depending on the size of the companies. On this table, you can see that losses were extremely high in clothing and shoes sector, as well as in housekeeping devices, electronic devices and household items, but especially small companies um, suffered from the development of e-commerce, while big companies, especially those with more than 250 employees, benefited or rather benefited from e-commerce. The increase of the households in France would have destroyed around 121,000 jobs in small uh, companies of less than uh, 20 employees. Destroyed 9,000 employment uh, within uh, small companies uh, between 20 and 200 employees while e-commerce would have favored the creation of employment uh, 
around 9,000 employment uh, in companies bigger than 250 employees. So hence the conclusion of the study is that for one job created in the e-commerce, in the non-food retail sector in a big company, around six jobs were destroyed in small and medium-sized companies in the period 2009-2018. We also carried out estimations on wholesale and for two other countries, uh, Germany and Spain, in order to be able to carry out some comparisons at the European level. The growth of e-commerce uh, led to the destruction of uh, jobs in France, uh, around 80,000 jobs, that is 17%. Um, while there were only 3,000 destructions in, of jobs in Germany, that is 0.5% of the personnel in that sector in Germany. While in Spain, there were 49,000 dis job destructions. Wholesale, no. Digitalization in France allowed to create 33,000 employments during the same period. That means 17% of employment in that country, while Germany suffered with a loss of with 70% with um, a high percentage of uh, those workers suffering and only 6,000 employments created in Spain. If we add up all those numbers to France and Germany would have lost between 2009 and 2018 because of the growth of e-commerce around 80,000 jobs. This is the total for retail and wholesale sectors, 80,000 jobs for France and Germany and Spain that's a bit better with only 43,000 jobs destroyed. Then we have projections in the predictions of job creations or destruction because of e-commerce in the different sectors that have been presented by 2028. To be able to carry out those predictions, we based our efforts on the observations we had. They were presented by Anno in the first part and the studies of online behavior patterns in the group age 24 to 35 in the first scenario. This is S1 and we had another prediction with the projection of the behavior of the 25 to 34 year olds to a projection to the whole population. Why did we do that? Well, because we think that in the following years, online purchasing is going to increase. And we had a look at the at numbers of Eurostat, the European Institute for Statistics, and we realized that around 60% of Europeans bought at least one good online or one service online in 2018. So that is for everyone from 16 to 60. So of course, uh, elder people tend to buy less online and it has a diminishing effect on this number. So around 80% um, of aged people uh, aged um, 24 to 35. So if we project that to the whole population, we can really expect more job losses in or job creations in wholesale because of those changes in the online purchasing behaviors. The job losses in the different sectors would amount to 46,000 jobs destroyed in France. In the, um, in the more optimistic scenario and 152,000 jobs destroyed in Spain. In the second scenario where the 
where people would buy more online, the impact would be even higher for France and Germany, with up until uh, 87,000 and 121,000 jobs destroyed, especially in the retail sector for Spain. The impact would be a bit um, lower than in the first scenario, with 118,000 jobs destroyed by 2028. I think that I was able to present the different uh, numbers of this, the main numbers of that study, and of course you have uh, more information in the report. Uh, I could not go through them because the time we had was quite restricted. The microphone of the speaker. So we included um, different services because e-commerce is also about giants such as Amazon, but there are other stakeholders such as online banking, or Airbnb, or, and others who are threatening other uh, typical historical commercial agents in our economies. That's why we also included them in our study. That's it for us. So, Leila, we give you back the floor for the next part of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very um, interesting presentation, this synthesis of the study. I invite you all who would like to read the study to go on my uh, website, Leila Shabi dot fr to um, read this study uh, complete this complete study in this presentation we decided to focus in on the situations in germany spain and france when it comes to spain we see that the predictions are quite um, really worrying florence was explaining that um, up until 100, up to 152,000 jobs could be destroyed. And today in the speakers, we have uh, my colleague, Maria Eugenia Rodriguez Palop, who is MEP in GUE uh, for Podemos. And Maria Rodriguez Palop is my colleague in the Ample and Social Committee. She is a Spanish and she took part to the international hearings of Amazon workers. I asked um, Maria Eugenia to take the floor to explain the situation in Spain with the employment crisis that is really strong in Spain. The social and economic uh, impact of the COVID-19 crisis are really deep. Maria Eugenia, you have the floor and thank you for taking part to the webinar today. Oye bien, Leila, ahora. Sí, ahora okay. bien. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Well, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for this study. Congratulate you all for this great effort and what you have done. And it's welcome. We welcome this study in Spain. It's very important right now. It's on the desk of the Ministry of Labor. As you know, the Labor Minister is from Unidas Podemos, so from our party and right now she's following very closely what is happening right now regarding platform workers and in this case specifically regarding amazon workers so e-commerce as it has already been said well has destroyed employment greatly um, it's uh, really going against jobs and we see a huge concentration of volume. Um, we have seen 43,000 jobs lost and destroyed, but as you said, it could go up to 120,000 or 152,000 jobs destroyed for 2028. And we see that the situation is dramatic. It's a very dramatic situation, a very complex situation. We know that SMEs and small retail uh, shops are having huge problems due to the pandemic and 
they are also facing the impact of e-commerce and the current situation in Spain, it's very difficult in the work uh, market. We see that in Spain, well, we were highly dependent on the tourism sector and right now the current situation is going against this and we see huge levels of consumptions in e-commerce uh, never seen before in the study we could see that this is having a huge impact on the work model it will be more dramatic compared to the figures in germany and in france right now we have structural unemployment youth unemployment which is much higher than the average of the eu and we also see precarious uh, job conditions. And we also had a previous uh, labor reform from the PP party, the conservative party that was in power before, which has been terrible, uh, terrible impact, very low salaries, very low uh, union rates. And we see that the pandemic has had a huge impact on the sectors, the main sectors, that um, are related to our economy, specifically the service sector and tourism. So we had to introduce specific policies uh, through the Ministry of Labor. We would have reached 20% of unemployment, but we introduced temporary unemployment schemes and we were able to have lower unemployment rates. Right now, it's a terrible situation due to the current context, but we also have structural problems. So our labor model is structurally has a lot of faults. And we see that right now in Spain, uh, we have seen that Amazon has increased the number of workers from 7,000 to 12,000 jobs, uh, 12,000 new jobs. Unfortunately, it poses huge risks and dangers. The labor conditions and the treatment of these workers, they also have a monopoly position that uh, this company has in its sector. And we also see some terrible tax policies of this company. Regarding work conditions, I'll be very brief, we don't have too much time. Amazon hires workers in a fraudulent way. And we see that the work inspection had to put fines to the company. 4,000 of the workers uh, were bogus self-employed. And very often, well, they were belonging to different companies of the group. We see similar situations in Deliveroo or Uber, for example and they are not paying what they need to pay the contributions to social security. In 2019, we also know that in Catalonia, Amazon spied on trade unionists and to all workers that participate in the different strikes. And there is a uh, true uh, union bashing. So they are really going against workers that participate in social movements and that participate in trade unions or even environmental organizations. They have gone against collective bargaining in Spain. And we see in the 30 work sites, there are no works council unheard of in a company of this size. So we see that it has brought about some work conflicts. And as Leila has said, we have been able to address this in, in the campaign that she has promoted. And we saw that there was no way in making sure that some of the work sites in San Fernando, for example, the collective uh, agreement was not being implemented. So there was a lack of coverage, social security, and uh, we also had huge problems regarding salaries. During the pandemic, they did not want to temporarily close disinfect the installations going against the health of employees and clients. And well, they were not um, only focusing on essential products, for example, food or um, pharmaceutical products. Amazon has grown, it has reduced prices, concentrating offers through a labor model that is fraudulent, going against work conditions and reducing work conditions of its employees, going against them, harassing them with mobbing and controlling them with algorithms. And this has is bringing about a situation that is truly terrifying. So cognitive capitalism, we could say. 
and they are controlling the data of employees and using them commercially and also politically. Furthermore, we can add that the salary of the staff has been cut continuously up to 10% and the labor conditions and labor contracts are very temporary and precarious. And then we have gender gap. And we see that very often we're talking about male employees and we see the introduction of robotization and this is putting further risk jobs. We also need to add that during the pandemic, we see the, um, the reason that has uh, impaired in Amazon has been money, money over employees, over health. And regarding providers, although they're leaders in the digital e-commerce, we see that what they're paying in taxes is ridiculous because uh, their profits go to Luxembourg where they pay less taxes. And the OCDE has even claimed that we need to introduce digital taxes. And this is what we want to introduce in Spain. And it will be a new tax starting in spring with an 10% at a 10% taxes for companies such as Amazon, digital companies. So just to finish, the study serves to show is that Amazon is a huge danger for workers and for the sector and furthermore does not provide added value with no positive impact on society. So we need to organize ourselves and we need to organize ourselves to make uh, them accountable. So thank you very much again, Leila, for the great work you do. And uh, unfortunately, I need to take a train, so I won't be available for the questions. Really sorry about this, but thank you so much uh, for inviting us. And thank you uh, for working with Unidas Podemos and with our workers and allowing us to be witness of what is happening. And Leila knows um, they are in contact with the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Labor is considering uh, very seriously the conclusions of the study. So thank you again. Merci. Thank you very much, Maria Eugenia. Thank you so much uh, for this testimony. Thank you for showing how in Spain, as elsewhere, Amazon is destroying many employment, uh, many employments, but also work more generally speaking. And you can leave for your train. You indeed told us you wouldn't be able to stay. And we count on you for uh, continuing this struggle. Let me now give the floor to uh, a worker, a woman worker, Magda Malinowska. She comes from Poland and she took part in the auditions we organized. And Magda is part of an international uh, Amazon workers network. And it is very interesting to see how in Amazon strategy, well, they have national, European and international stakes. And to oppose herself to Amazon, well, some bridges have been built. And even though Amazon does everything it can so that uh, uh, employees are um, spied on, well, br bridges are built between people who even sometimes speak different languages and Magda comes from Poland in Poznan and she is part of this internet Amazon uh, Amazon workers international network and she's going to explain how warehouses work how um, work is organized and thank you Magda for being here over to you Witam. Welcome very warmly to all of you. My name is Magda Malinowska, and I welcome you on behalf of the um, Organizacja Pracownicza, the trade union, and on behalf of our international network, Amazon Workers International, that's what it's called. I am from Poland, and really, in Poland, we do not have much of an experience with regards to the uh, getting rid, rid of the workplaces, despite of uh, the predictions that it would happen. 
we can uh, see that the Polish Amazon web page does not does not exist. So we serve the German market, really. And what happens in e-commerce is that this situation uh, is possible and it's uh, influences the work conditions because Amazon opens up the warehouses in Poland and it has the um, uh, consequences not only for Poland but also for Germany as we know very well because between our warehouses the items are being sent um, when the German workers are on strike then the items are being sent to the warehouses in Poland and distributed from there. Amazon influences the work conditions because it creates certain standards uh, in terms of work organization and they use certain technologies that they uh, create. These technologies serve to control us, to observe us, to survey us, even to establish the distance, physical distance between the workers. And also Amazon is creating new standards with regards to the uh, uh, trade unions, workers and the employer. And we cannot agree to that. That's why we've been organizing ourselves in those warehouses and we are trying to um, uh, draw on the good um, aspects of it because of the scale of that company. We as workers, we can say that it's uh, not felt by us that the small companies and medium-sized companies will have problems with Amazon. Because for us, it's, um, it's, it, we get the impression that it may be even more difficult to self-organize in trade unions in a small shop or a small business than in Amazon. We know that in many places in the world, in uh, Europe and beyond, we work in a company where the work conditions are quite similar. Of course, they do um, take advantage on the differences and they work towards weakening us as workers. However, it creates the network of connections between us, which give us enormous possibilities of self-organization so that we can fight for the working conditions and the pay conditions and improve them. We have used that. We uh, took advantage of that during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, our work conditions changed. A lot has changed, not only in terms of uh, work organization, but in terms of the relations between us and the and the company, especially through the protests in France and because of that um, court case uh, about the lack of communication and uh, communication and consultation with, uh, with regards to the uh, organization uh, of work in the workplace. So a lot has changed in our relations. During the pandemic, we have understood very well that the mutual contacts between us are of vital importance, not only about the warehouses in Europe, but the exchange of information between the warehouses in between us and the US. It was a, a enormously fruitful experience. So it um, uh, allowed us to force uh, and to um, make the company um, uh, realize our, um, our demands. So Amazon cannot just ignore it. 
they have to introduce certain changes. For example, the temperature, uh, uh, taking the measurements of the body temperature of the workers. So we managed to achieve one of the demands of the workers, one of the most important ones, really, to block so-called evaluation of effectiveness and um, uh, firing them for not achieving those norms. It's an enormous achievement and uh, it's been implemented since last year. So those negative uh, uh, points uh, that could lead to losing a job uh, are no longer. So they wanted us to work faster and faster and faster, but we managed to stop that trend and block it. And they don't do it in Amazon anymore. Of course, they try and they look for new methods of forcing us. But we are exchanging information between countries, how they want to do it and what they do. But those norms of uh, efficiency or effectiveness cannot be used as a reason for uh, firing uh, and uh, letting go of people. We also managed to gain an additional payment uh, on the hourly rate that we were getting during the pandemic. Of course, uh, it's not uh, hanky-dory and beautiful. Amazon uh, is using the inequalities between us, between the countries, and we in Poland, for example, uh, have not received any um, any regular uh, pay rise uh, on our wages, despite the fact that Amazon had earned uh, an enormous amounts of money and profits. We did not get any pay rises because Amazon is calculating it on the basis of the data from the regions and unemployment in those regions. So as you were saying that if, if the average pay in the region where the warehouses are placed, um, uh, they, they, they calculate that the pay rises are not eligible. So our, our rates can even go lower and we are protesting against that because we want to have influence on the work organization, but also on the pay levels. Because if you establish the pay rate on the basis of the average pay in the region, that only um, uh, solidifies the inequalities. And our friends in Germany uh, know very well that we will not achieve um, the same pay, pay rates as them, but their situation can get worse. That's why we are trying to work together. And we know that if Amazon enters new territories, new countries, we will also fight for the highest rates of pay, because that influence influences uh, all of us. And just for the end, because I know that 10 minutes uh, is coming to a close, once uh, one of our managers said a, a funny sentence, perhaps Amazon is not paying a lot, but it shows and teaches the workers, especially new ones, how they should be working. For our managers, this is an added value, so to speak of being employed by Amazon, that Amazon is a tool of dressage of people so that they are succumbing to work regardless whether they are uh, uh, in, the work in the workhouse, on the floor, in the toilet, in the canteen, that they are, that they are being followed and, and, and they are succumbing to work. It has influence on our on our family lives, of course, and we have to protest against that, against that. And we are, 
we are counting on your support. And since we are here amongst people who can speak in the European Parliament, the interesting subject is how to support the workers from various countries who work for the same company, but they cannot draw uh, on the same labor code uh, rules. And this is the question, how to maintain the international standards of work were broader and were influencing uh, people and that the trade unions could use. This would be uh, very useful for our situation. It's very important for us. If somewhere in Parliament, in the European Parliament, where people who, who would be dealing with that, we'd be very happy to talk to them to exert pressure on that company. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magda. Indeed, it is crucial to build bridges between workers at an international level. And indeed, this can be a good answer, a counter-strike to Amazon, which tries to consolidate its position in Europe. Warehouses in Poland do not aim at serving Poland because when you live in Poland and you want to order something, indeed, you need to go to Amazon.de. Amazon understood how to use the European market, the differences in wages from one European country to another, uh, the fact that wages are lower in Poland than in Germany. Paul, uh, Amazon has also under, understood it was important uh, to destroy bridges between workers. And what you said uh, is very interesting. And indeed, it is important to counter-strike uh, and to build uh, more bridges during the auditions we talked about maybe well confronting uh, uh, directly amazon europe's director within the european parliament is something we have in mind but we think it would be much more interesting to do this uh, in flesh and bone than on Zoom. But as soon as it will be possible, count on us to organize such a, an event. We want Amazon workers from different countries throughout Europe to have the possibility to talk within the European Parliament directly with Amazon Europe's director. Let me now give the floor to Alma Dufour, who comes from France. She is responsible of the Amazon campaign for Friends of the Earth. Alma, Alma is always there on the ground whenever we talk about Amazon and when we want to fight the creation of a new warehouse and uh, she's there for all initiatives against Amazon and uh, she will uh, now um, take the floor. Uh, we all know her, we have all seen her on the street fighting against Amazon. So uh, Alma, could you please talk about what's happened lately in France? and also explain how uh, French government's decisions have had consequences, uh, uh, positive consequences for Amazon. And could you also talk about the different mobilizations in which you are uh, deeply involved? Yes, yes, thank you, Leila, for this invitation and good evening to all of you. I will try not to speak too fast, fast for the interpreters. So indeed, yeah, yeah. We have understood from this study and uh, from what's happening in Spain that e-trade today seems to be something unavoidable. E-shopping is a phenomenon which is doomed to happen. People buy online, youngsters buy online, and it, it, it's not wrong indeed with ICTs and so on, people buy online, but as you've said, e-shopping is dominant today, not only because there are ICTs, but also because there is a lack of uh, 
fiscal and legislative uh, because legal and fiscal rules are lacking and uh, this uh, leads to an uh, an even playing ground for uh, SMEs and uh, on the other hand multinationals such as Amazon e-commerce started in France and came big first of all they started huge warehouses warehouses which could implement themselves without any valid license without having to apply for any valid licenses and um, uh, all of this was done even though it could uh, potentially well uh, lead to more unemployment anywhere you whenever you want to create a big store a big warehouse whatsoever you need to apply for li licenses and amazon could just come and do whatever they want they uh, said they would do some industrial buildings and nothing related to e-shopping e-commerce but uh, the, this is horrible but there is, there is worse actually amazon pays very few taxes yeah. Many tend to think that, well, um, uh, Amazon and e-commerce are unavoidable and as a consequence, well, many tend to think that, well, uh, employment should be preserved and, uh, um, and as a consequence, well, uh, uh, people are more and more exploited. But what you need to bear in mind is that Amazon tends to sell at loss, which is supposed to be uh, forbidden. And uh, Amazon does not give any dividends to its share, uh, shareholders. And uh, Amazon does all of this, all of this, but in the end, this is not possible for any company. Uh, this is not sustainable and cannot work on the long run. Then uh, you also have to bear in mind that there is a, a, a huge fraud with VAT. Indeed, hundreds of uh, million small companies developed themselves on the Amazon marketplace and they uh, forget to pay their taxes. And that's why youngsters buy on uh, e-commerce it's not only because they like deliveries in 24 hours it's also because everything is 20 percent cheaper because uh, europeans don't have to pay vat vat which is one of the bases of uh, ta taxes of the ta of the fiscal system in europe and amazon has almost a monopole on e-commerce and uh, they don't pay uh, that and well, one billion uh, for Amazon. Well, it represents actually well uh, what uh, the French government wants to cut in retirement. And actually, the government is also aware of that. It is aware of the different studies on job destruction. It must be somewhere uh, on a desktop at the government offices in France, but it is not doing anything. What's worse is that they are actually favoring Amazon in the new law on climate. While um, brick and mortar shops are struggling uh, because of a uh, difficult economic situation and also because of the COVID-19. What's the government doing? It is imposing a, new, a moratorium on new commercial areas, but not on e-commerce. And it is quite puzzling because the signal they send to the market is a puzzling. They know that the giants of big retail online, such as Zara, closed 1,500 shops around the world. What they are saying? Well, Go on, Sh shut your closet, your your shops, and but please keep on doing commerce online. It's extremely serious because it is going to even more deteriorate the economic uh, crisis. It is disastrous for the market. 
what's the interest where when you need to keep your shop your physical shops you cannot uh, in, implant yourself in new areas you need to pay taxes and amazon is at an advantage against you because it pays less taxes there are different reasons it can be explained on the one hand uh, by the ideology in favor of uh, digitalism in liberal governments. Uh, everything that's digital, it's progress. Digital rhymes with progress. Amazon is progress. It's not the case. Amazon is slavery. It's feudalism. It's, well, of course, it is um, glamorous messages, but it's not the case. They say that uh, technology is inevitable. It's not the case. It goes beyond that. It's not the only reason. Uh, in fact, they, um, the uh, whole retail sector is uh, furious, and this is about 2 million jobs in France, and it is, of course, very complicated to do that in a very difficult uh, crisis, and there is a kind of pact with the devil uh, between the government and Amazon, because Amazon is um, opening warehouses in um, vulnerable areas, de-industrialized area. Bosch is closing the uh, coal area exploitation is closing we are coming to save you and to give you a job and uh, the government is really happy to accept those projects very quickly no questions asked and not putting into place a real industrial plan for france because amazon is not really about industry it's not creating anything it is only selling things secondly Cam amazon is the first ipo uh, in the world, uh, Amazon is supported by Wall Street, Amazon is supported by BlackRock, our government is uh, closer to the finance, it wants to make Paris the new financial marketplace in Europe after the after Brexit. So you need to, inter to understand the vested interests that uh, exist with the government and Amazon and of course there are more geopolitical considerations, it is the first um, um, the, the first capital um, in the United States and uh, um, uh, there are other Chinese giants as well and so clearly the political situation is really tense Hence, in the climate law, we are pushing in favor of fair rules for everyone and moratorium for also for new warehouses. What, they, what we are told it is that is going to promote European dumping. That's why we were really happy to hear the Spanish MEP saying that things are also moving at the Spanish government because we need European coalition with important countries in order to put pressure on the European Commission because it did not act a lot up until now. We also need to fight, to fight at the local level. That's why I wanted to talk about mobilization. When we understood that the government will never support us, we thought that we would have to fight at the local level. It is extremely tiring. We are supporting around 10 local struggles against the creation of warehouses. What's interesting is that those struggles um, allows allow us to build bridges between people that generally don't talk to each other uh, greens small bosses workers it's really interesting politically in the fight against amazon because it can recreate political identities in globalization people need to understand that they have the same enemies the same interests that things always move it has not been the, the situation has evolved dramatically for 10 years now we work in uh, on different streams. We work in justice, we refer to the judiciary system. When the government is not acting, we are all, all, also demonstrating a lot. We are putting a lot of public pressure on the elected members of parliament. We cannot only count on justice for our fight against Amazon. Let's not forget as well that the fight is also a, a big symbol. 
It, it is about a friend from Notre Dame des Landes, a big project of a net port near Nantes that was abandoned uh, after a mobilization that lasted for 50 years. And it combined two small companies, uh, two uh, leftist trade unions. It's quite unprecedented. In Alsace, we also were able to um, Push Am to push Amazon to stop its projects of new warehouses. It's not enough. We need laws. We won't be able to do that for 20 years. It is, ex it is really exhausting. It is the fight of David against Goliath. But with that fight, with that struggle, with those visible actions for the public opinion, we think we would be able to raise the awareness of people, of citizens, of consumers. Since the beginning of the COVID-19, consumers are starting to understand the situation. They won't stop buying at Amazon, of course, but little by little, awareness is being raised. We are seeing things evolving, and thanks, Leila, for your initiative. We need to go to scale up our efforts at the European level in order to counter the giant of Amazon. I will stop here because I think it has already been so long. Thank you very much, Alma, for this very quick, fast um, message and uh, explanation of the situation in France, uh, the political backdrop against which those mobilizations are taking place, and the issue of VAT fraud. I think that people mentioned that on the chat. We have seen how mobilization was possible at the national level. We also thought it was important to talk about the international level because mobilization we heard at the local level is also reflected at the international level. There is a whole range of stakeholders, as is the case at the local level. We have Nick Rudikoff, who is really proactive in this international coordination against Amazon. It is, he is working at UniGlobal, a confederation of trade unions at the international level. He is going to talk about the international mobilization against Amazon. Nick, you have the floor. Your microphone. Thanks, Lila. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and uh, I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint with you. Uh, so I'm with Uni Global Union, and um, we are the global union for the services sector around the world. And that means that Amazon touches our key sectors uh, very significantly, and, and those include commerce, uh, uh, post and logistics, and internet and telecommunications, so ICTS, which would be tech workers as well as call center workers. Um, I wanna commend the authors of the report on an excellent uh, presentation. And I wanted to share sort of our perspectives on how Amazon is both destroying jobs uh, and degrading jobs globally. Um, so what we're, we're, we're I just wanna jump into this PowerPoint. And, you know, obviously people have mentioned this before, but Amazon had an incredible year uh, in 2020 due to the pandemic, uh, incredible and historic year. But this is how things looked before the pandemic. And this, I think, reflects, this is Amazon's market capitalization versus the market capitalization of the world's largest retailers. Uh, this reflects that the, the, the enthusiasm that investors in the stock market places in Amazon's ability to own the future. Uh, based on its dominant position in web services and e-commerce and logistics, uh, sort of the three major infrastructure points. Uh, so but then the, the pandemic happened and Amazon stock, as, as Lila and others have mentioned, went through the roof. This is how it looks today. Um, truly a troubling statistic that Amazon's market cap almost doubled, as Lila pointed out, its profits doubled and the market basket of major retailers increased a little bit, even though they had incredible years. Uh, there's a long way to go for Europe, because if you look at e-commerce uh, penetration, as uh, the authors of the report pointed out, there's, there's tremendous growth that can happen both in the United States, Canada, France, all over the Europe, when you compare it to other countries. And already, Amazon has incredible penetration into Europe. This is a statistic pre-pandemic that shows more than 
uh, internet users in major European economies already are Amazon Prime members. Uh, Lila asked that I talk about the global um, footprint of Amazon outside of Europe. And, and, and this is really the state of play today. Um, obviously, huge concentrations in the US, but also in India, which people don't talk about as much. Uh, and then a number of countries where Amazon is, is growing rapidly uh, recently. But I think this is the really interesting story that I wanted to share with everybody, is the incredible growth we saw in Amazon facilities globally during 2020. This wasn't because of the pandemic. Like these, these buildings were planned, these construction projects were planned beforehand, but Amazon increased its facility count by 42% in 2020, which is incredible when you look at it in historical context uh, you know, there are other big building years in 2018, they put up 20, 30 buildings, they brought, they brought 624 online with 300 now, so 300 in construction. So you're talking really about a thousand new buildings in the last year or so uh, that are solidifying Amazon's position. The important thing, we looked at the buildings they actually built globally, and more than any other facility, they built these things called delivery stations. 61% uh, of new facilities were delivery stations. And delivery stations are really important um, because all packages that leave a delivery station leave that facility with precarious, subcontracted, misclassified, uh, bogus self-employed workforces. So when we talk about destruction of good jobs in either the commerce sector or in the logistics sector, uh, either in the US or in Europe, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about Amazon taking jobs that workers struggled for generations to build standards in these sectors uh, at logistics companies like DHL, UPS, or the US Postal Service, uh, or in commerce companies, in supermarkets, fashion retail stores. So Amazon is destroying jobs and it's reducing the standards and quality of jobs. And I think that's the real threat uh, to workers. So when we're fighting for Amazon workers, we are fighting to raise standards in Amazon, but it's not just that, it's a fight to protect the standards we have won around the world through generations of struggle by workers, trade unions and allies. Um, so we've been very active uh, last year, uh, we submitted uh, comment on the Digital Services Act to the European Commission. Uh, we work closely with Lila, as she mentioned, on fighting back on Amazon surveillance of workers. Uh, we, we, we sent letters to the commission. We're going to continue to press this issue because Amazon is perhaps the most sophisticated digital surveillance company in the world. And it's the only big tech company of the GAFAs with a huge uh, blue collar workforce. 1.2 million odd warehouse workers, hundreds of thousands of delivery drivers, subcontracted and misidentified. All of these workers are subject to Amazon surveillance initiatives, the, what we call the Amazon panopticon, because Amazon can see all of these things in real time, all of this data goes into Amazon systems and is analyzed, not by human beings, but by sophisticated algorithms, um, by algorithms that learn on their own, uh, not without, without human intervention. So this is a key area where we'll be fighting back. We were really excited last year uh, with Amazon Workers International, uh, with our comrades at Friends of the Earth, to launch and Progressive International, uh, who we work closely with us on, to launch Make Amazon Pay, which is a global planetary campaign to challenge Amazon on a whole host of issues, uh, including climate, tax avoidance, antitrust, digital surveillance, and workers' rights. And we're incredibly proud of, of the coalition that we built uh, from the global north and the global south. Uh, for, with our global, our sister global trade unions like the International Transport Workers Federation and Industrial, uh, to the Hawkers Joint Action Committee, which is the organization in India that represents small uh, traders, and we took action collectively around the world um, on Black Friday. Uh, 
and workers, politicians, activists all sp spoke out, stood up together. And we had the biggest global day of action against Amazon to date, but our mobilization this year needs to be even bigger uh, in 2021. So we're counting on all of you here on this call and all of our comrades and allies uh, to join us in this fight. Uh, after the global day of action, a week later, uh, a letter came out from over 400 elected officials in 34 countries echoing the common demands um, and, and calling on Amazon to join together. And so I, I think this is, this is actually something that what Alma referenced a moment before, which is that we are forming new coalitions and, and recovering new identities um, as actors, as individuals, as trade unionists, as workers in our organizations and with our elected allies around the world. So, you know, as Amazon is this sort of dystopic vision of the future, what we're creating is a vision of the future that we all want to see happen uh, based on solidarity, justice, sustainability. Um, so in 2021, we have to increase our activity. And that means fighting on all of these fronts together um, we have building alliances at the global level, at the local level, um, and at the, at the regional level. And you know, we're just really excited about the work. And I think it's important uh, in these sort of dark days to remember um, Amazon is not the sole culprit of the terrible situation we find ourselves in, right? Um, Amazon is a symbol. It's a leader in the movement to destroy democracy and solidarity and justice. But we have faced all of these crises on the screen, which I'll read in a moment, uh, before, and we are gonna fight them and win them together. So we have all, we've been facing declining worker power and growth of precarious work for a while. Corporate concentration, especially in big tech, the GAFAs is a serious problem that needs to be addressed if we're gonna survive as a society. Uh, wealth inequality is skyrocketing globally and has been for decades, but Jeff Bezos, the soon to be former CEO of Amazon, exemplifies it better than almost anyone. And then climate impacts and tax avoidance and digital surveillance. These are all foundational issues that we need to solve as social movements, as trade unions, as elected officials together. And Amazon is really the gift, actually. It brings us together uh, like no other corporation to wage these battles. And you know, I'm just very excited and thankful uh, to be with such uh, dedicated comrades. And I know together that uh, we can win this. So thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for this very energetic, combative, and passionating intervention. It was really interesting. Well, we are about the end of uh, the speaking time uh, for our speakers, and we have a Q&A now. Maybe uh, a quick conclusion after those speeches. I think you explained really well how Amazon killed jobs but also killed our social progress, our social acquis, and killed our economies as well. And you explained that there were prospects, there were possibilities for mobilization at the international, regional and local level. And it really raised my hopes. It lifted my spirits. As Alma said, we could uh, gather people of a different um, walk walk of life. So it's really interesting for the follow up of the mobilization in the Q&A, we have different questions. The first of, of them deals with local businesses. I think that question is rather destined to Alma, but you can reply, but it is about the protection of uh, local businesses that are under competition that are essential. Shouldn't there be rules uh, implemented as we were able to do for the cinema industry in France, the film industry in France. Alma, could you provide an answer to that question? Yes, I'm trying. I will try to. It's interesting. Indeed, um, they should abide by the same rules as the uh, physical shops. They are extremely powerful, but they have rules in their favor. 
So I think that we should put an end to uh, VAT fraud. It would be a good start. And uh, there is a European reform. It's not implemented. And that reform is still uh, lacking in some parts because there are still loopholes for fraud. Um, for example, in Cyprus, because Cyprus gives the VAT numbers to just anyone. And uh, Amazon was boasting about that. Amazon was saying that the number of um, European buyers exploded on Amazon platform. I think that it is just a, another step in VAT fraud. And so the fight is not finished. And so long we are not able to uh, solve that issue, we won't be able to help uh, small businesses. But clearly, there is a... We need, we need to go beyond that. We need to put in place rules in order to favor small size businesses because they are more threatened. Uh, rules in favor of stakeholders uh, in e-commerce, but who also have uh, bricks and mortar shops. Of course, society is evolving towards e-commerce, so it has to be taken into, taken into account. We already wanted to have a moratorium against the big warehouses that are being built by Amazon in order to have economies of scales. We wanted to avoid also dumping uh, from abroad. We wanted also to create a specific system for small businesses in order to support them in their development of e-commerce and to um, reduce their uh, rents, the, the rents they have to pay, commercial uh, rents and so on and so forth. And for books, for example, there was a protectionist policy in order to support the sector. And uh, there was the issue of the real invoicing of delivery, because Amazon on the delivery is at a loss. No one can do 24 hours delivery while being profitable. Amazon today is completely competitive because there is no prohibition of that practice, the sell at a loss. If we had better wages for uh, logistic workers, of course, this situation would be easier for small shops, for small businesses. So if all the temps were uh, hired by Amazon, the situation would improve. Uh, better wages, the situation would improve. If we were to rebalance all of that, if we were to rebalance, as Nick was saying, the working conditions in all the um, different sectors, we, were, we would protect the small, uh, the small workers and smaller businesses. Amazon is uh, frauding VAT. Amazon is having 44% of temp of temps in its staff it's almost half of its staff that are temporary workers so it's really difficult to compete against that thank you very much alma i have another question um it's not possible to read it all through it's from miriam uh, on a works council at the European Euro level, European works council were a tool in order to echo the voice of employees, of workers of Amazon, as in any company. So this is a question for Nick and maybe to Magda. Would the creation of Euro European works council for Amazon worker be a possibility? And was it contemplated could it be a tool in favor of mobilization of workers? I am happy to answer that. Uh, my understanding of works councils, and, and I and I at this point have to uh, admit to being an American, uh, is that works councils were, and I don't have a tremendous amount of background with works councils, but I will say that my understanding of works councils is that when workers have real power within a company, uh, the works council becomes a very important tool for the workers to exercise their power. But in a situation like Amazon, where we're at now, where workers, we, do, we, you know, we have not won, we have not beaten Amazon, like we are still fighting Amazon aggressively uh, to build power within the company, uh, I'm not sure whether a works council would be useful, but I would defer to those who know more about it.
No, my wiemy, że już trwają przygotowania do powstania takiej rady i w tej chwili działa zespół. Well, we know that there is preparation on the way. There is a special negotiating body. There is one person uh, who uh, is listening to us currently and she, uh, well, Agnieszka Mrus is a person who is a member of this um, special negotiating body. Amazon is a very difficult uh, opponent um, as far as dialogue, um, social dialogue is concerned. And well, they kind of pretend to talk to us, but de facto, they do not talk to us. They give us information which is actually not important, unimportant. And we are afraid actually that the situation will be the same with the European Works Council. In Amazon, we have the so-called personnel fora or workers for, fora. They are supposed to um, substitute uh, trade unions and uh, workers representatives. But these fora are created by Amazon and very often persons within the fora are people who are well liked by the employer who kind of know how to talk to the management or are management's cronies so amazon describes these fora as uh, coming reaching out to to workers but actually it's trying to circumvent um social dialogue so if um, workers want to organize, but if they are not um, strong in their um, in, in places where they work, then nothing can help, help us. Um, I can see in Germany, workers are quite strong and um, people who are really want to work for the employees uh, are members of the Works Council in Germany, but in countries where employees are weak, then the Works Councils can work actually uh, for the benefit of the employer. So the most important thing is to be strong as employees because um, otherwise we won't be able to be strong as the workers' representatives in the works councils. I hope we can build works councils and we will be able to exert pressure on the company. Thank you both of you for this answer on European Works Council. Another question from uh, Stéphane, Stéphane Corbion, on confidentiality provisions signed by elected uh, officials when Amazon is building a warehouse. You don't know it's Amazon until you see the warehouse is of Amazon. If elected officials tell the press or the citizens who elected them that Amazon is going to build a warehouse, they risk, uh, um, they risk to have a sanction. Here Stéphane Corbion uh, says, uh, said that uh, elected officials accepted to pay 15,000 euros fine if they divulge the name of Amazon. I'm thinking again of Alma to talk about that. Uh, would you like to talk about that, please, Alma? Um, yes. Yes, indeed. The question of legality once again. Mm, the legality of this practice is critical. We are in a democracy and local um, public officers think they can sign whatever they want um, and this leads to major issues because indeed uh, law is supposed to be blind and not create any discrimination in between any company and that's what they actually say they say it doesn't matter whether it's amazon or not but a globalized company such as amazon which uh, ha ha frauds with vat with other taxes which uh, plays with employment well in a healthy democracy uh, should not be the first to implement itself on a given uh, place and it is important to go to court 
because who is held accountable for all promises are not, which are not held by Amazon in the end? That's a critical question. Uh, promises vis-a-vis -vis employment creation, vis-a-vis -vis many other things, because we've seen that employment tends uh, to be reduced over time with uh, robotization and automation, not to mention temp workers and uh, actually uh, detached workers, uh, Polish or Spanish workers working in France with uh, their uh, full-time wage from Spain or Poland in France, uh, not to mention the fact that, well, because of all of this, we don't know who to hold accountable for the non-compliance non with commitments. And uh, at uh, the biggest site in France, well, they were able to not pay one cent in taxes. And this is a huge scandal. And this shows, well, the, mm, the organized and criminal um, strategy Amazon uses. It looks like mafia. And it has been used, uh, it, it's a term we've used with the government because indeed, uh, Amazon frauds as much as it can, well, just to have as, as many benefits and advantages as possible on employment, on taxes, and so on and so forth. This is a usual practice for Amazon, and it is important to fight this, but there are many uh, topics to tackle, unfortunately, whenever it comes to Amazon. Over to you, Leila. Thank you, Alma. I have a question for Anno and Florence. A question we've heard quite a lot lately, a question we've heard since we published the study on the social media. We were being told that this study is presented as an independent study with independent economists, but it's a study, study asked uh, for by uh, France Insoumise and Friends of the Earth. So how can you guarantee this study is independent and objective? Well, simply because Florence and I are not part of any political party. We have our own political positions. We are not member of any political family. And uh, we started working on such topics a few years ago with the uh, OCDE. Uh, I have worked quite a lot within the private sector and I still do it nowadays. And I want to continue doing it, uh, including for an insurance company. So, there is no complex, no bias whatsoever in our study. We assume this study, we endorse it, and actually no one has put into doubt the scientific validity of our study. So, I can support at 100% our study for rounds two, and this is something I could have written for another employer. My research obviously has limits. And well, here, simply the order comes from Leila, but this study could have been asked for by the French government, actually. It would have been the same result. And actually, that's the problem. Uh, we've been asking to the French government uh, to carry out a study for over two years, and that's why we decided actually to ask for a study. And this is terrible because um, we needed to do it. And if a, a private uh, consultancy had uh, made this study, well, then no one would have been opposed to it. But anyway, now we have to carry the can, although, well, Mm, we would have been very happy if the government had asked a consultancy to carry out a study, but the government simply doesn't want to recognize its own mistakes. Well, thank you. And as you said earlier, Alma, well, this government has the study on its desk and, well, I'm not sure if it's on the desk or next to it, <laughs> because they are not very happy with the result of this study. Okay, very well. 
Are there other questions? Yes, we have another question. So you've shown that the employment creation uh, argument from Amazon is false. But on productivity gains and quality gains, well, wouldn't the solution be political, i.e. reducing uh, work time? We would have an increased quality and time. I don't know if we talk about the quality of employment created by Amazon. I guess not because, well, uh, we've heard our speakers and I think things are clear, especially after hearing Nick and Magda. We've heard how employment works within Amazon. So what could we do? Re reduce the working time or rather fighting so that uh, the rights we have should be more defended and because well amazon robotizes more and more uh, well uh, everything anyway it looks like i answered my own question but do you want to bounce back on what i just said Alma, yes, over to you. Well, I could say something and then Florence and Anno, if they have an opinion on uh, the reduction of working time and the impact on employment, because this is not my specialty. But what I can say is that, well, these are interesting questions and what you've said is true. This could be interesting if people were well treated and uh, not in a precarious situation, if they had a fair wage then uh, on uh, increase of productivity well why not but we are, we are very far away from this debate then as you all know we are in a very different logical within different uh, governments throughout europe and in france the governments national governments want to uh, lengthen working days and not reduce them um, they also want to cut um, social wel welfare to induce a, a feeling of guilt and so that people go more and more to work and um, actually these governments lead an imp lead to an impossible situation for citizens citizens are reproached they cannot have a job and then they don't uh, government doesn't do anything uh, in order to fight amazon well, but i'm no expert whatsoever on uh, these topics and uh, on what uh, 22 hours week could um, do for employment Anyway, Florence, Ado, Ano, do you want to intervene on uh, productivity increase and the reduction of uh, working time and see things to the, through the lens of economists? Well, since Florence is not take, taking the floor, I'm going to intervene um, on the reduction of working time. The thing is that past experiences in different countries yeah, and in France didn't lead to the expected result on employment and this is why i think it is tricky well to try to put this topic on the table the thing is that well we mentioned robotization and automation and there well there will be a reduction of working time because of this and this may be well a, a challenge for uh, a government uh, society and as a consequence we will need to ask ourselves how to manage part-time unemployment more and more because more and more services and goods will be uh, produced with machines and capital and less and less work this is uh, the so said evolution then on the quality of employment and uh, unemployment you know my position and you know the proposals on the table uh, the, we could think about well green employments useful employments for society uh, employment warranties as well and other things could be even more interesting for society and the environment to, well, um, how shall I put it, uh, preserve employment because employment is important within our societies for each and every human being. People need work to feel proud to contribute to society as well.
I'd like to say one more thing on the first part of the question uh, about the figures of Amazon on job uh, creation with uh, uh, Alma and Anno. We talked uh, with journalists and we dug into the figures and Amazon says it creates, creates many jobs, but I think that their study was funded by a private consultancy, if I'm not mistaken, Anna, Alma and Anno. And actually, a cleaning lady in a warehouse is considered as a direct job creation. Although this new lady works for a, a third country, a third party country a company. And Amazon considers that even if this cleaning lady works two or three hours a day there, it's a direct job creation. And this explains well Amazon figure, Amazon's figures, which are a bit over the roof, if I may say. Alma, I know anything to add? Well, yeah, yes, indeed. I think Amazon has uh, this strategy with, with its communication. Uh, the bigger it is, the smoother it goes. And that's what they said with COVID. They said they imposed a, 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 a physical di the distancing of two meters, and this was uh, absolutely false. And employment, if we had to include for brick and mortar stores, well, uh, employment related to the creation of shops, well, then obviously, we would have full employment, but Amazon is clearly cheating there, and they try, they try to impress uh, public opinion and the media, which do not check the figures uh, put forward by Amazon. I tried uh, to uh, find some kind of logic, including everything I could include, but I do not even arrive at 7,000 uh, jobs, so they are very strong with these aggressive type of communication. That's it for me. Well, if the speakers want to say a final word, a conclusion, well, then you can. Oh, but I see someone is asking if we could compare these uh, figures with uh, the uh, taxes paid by Amazon. Well, it would be interesting. So over to you. I would just like to, to refer to the previous issue, please, if I may. We, as trade unionists and Amazon workers, are all for reduction in the working hours or for the introduction of uh, uh, including the commute time to get to work in the working time because some of the workers have to commute for about three or four or six hours. So it's like uh, having a second job, getting to work, if you know what I mean, which is not taken into account. And the paid time, working time is so uh, so low, so, so little that uh, really people are very tired when they get to work. So we in Poland and in Central and Eastern Europe, we have uh, observed the increase in jobs and to a large extent. Amazon is introducing robotics and robots, but the main, the main tool for work at Amazon, our people, our muscles, uh, our mass of people as well. And that's why they employ large numbers of workers. And that's why they create new, uh, new warehouses in Poland. There are 11 of them at the moment. And they only serve the German market only. 
and not in so distant future, they are planning to open the new warehouses and open up uh, their website for Poland. So most of the workers in Poland work on a temporary basis for Amazon, being employed, for example, through the um, employment agents. Only after having been employed by the work employment agency, they are being employed by Amazon, but even then uh, they get a um, short-term contract, work contracts, and that limits their ability to self-organize. But the workers come back to Amazon. However, a few months later, they leave, and then they are unemployed for some time, and then they go back again. So this is the situation, and then they lose their work, then they go back again. And this is something that really absolutely destroys the stability of employment and, and destroys the ability to self-organize by workers. And in a very large warehouse, for example, in the one that I'm working at, they are during a normal period, not during the uh, holidays, about 5,000 people. And before holidays, there are about 10,000 people. But they are being employed mainly through um, employment agencies. They get the short-term short contract. So we are very much divided. And it's very, very difficult to self-organize. And I know the numbers. And the numbers are, are huge. But this is the, you know, the, the zero-hour contracts type of work and very precarious work, too. Thank you very much. But if I may just sum up, I'd like to thank you uh, very much on behalf of our network, Amazon Workers International, and I would, I would encourage you to visit our Facebook page, our web page, and I do sincerely hope that we will meet together at the, um, our um, uh, protest action days and, and events. Thank you very much and see you then. Thank you, Magda. Thank you ever so much for this testimony. I remember you said that Amazon uh, tried to um, uh, to educate the workers. And indeed, here we see how they try to educate uh, these workers with six hours in, in transport. This is unacceptable. Indeed, people are then completely exhausted when they arrive at work. They do everything so that workers cannot uh, at all communicate, organize themselves, and they cannot even organize their personal lives in such circumstances. And well, thank you and hats off to you for your capacity in, well, in such circumstances, organizing workers on your side, but also uh, within uh, the framework of an international network. I do sincerely hope we'll have the opportunity to meet in flesh and bone with the other workers uh, and with all the other stakeholders who are fighting against uh, Amazon, national, local, international movements for the earth, for the environment, for local businesses and local shops. I do hope we will be able to do that. Now, uh, for the other speakers who wish to uh, say a final word, it's time. Just raise your hand show, show, or unmute yourselves. Nick, over to you. Thanks, Lila. And thanks to all the other panelists and uh, participants today. Um, I think there's uh, what I want to say in my final, my final points here is there's, I think, a tendency with companies like Amazon to focus on the newness, on the novelty uh, of what Amazon is trying to do. Amazon likes to talk about how it's so innovative and how they are always reimagining things. Well, they're actually doing what bosses have always done, uh, surveilling workers, 
busting unions, driving workers through aggressive productivity uh, mechanisms, implementing new technologies to make workers work harder, evading taxes. This is all standard practice. I think what's, so we like to say that what Amazon is doing is they like to put a 21st century veneer on a 19th century agenda, uh, where they're actually trying to bring us back to take away what we have won. Um, and that's what's totally unacceptable. I think what is new though, actually, perhaps is the urgency uh, because we're seeing through COVID with the, uh, the climate catastrophe we're facing, we're seeing acceleration of all these negative trends that we've all been watching for decades or decades uh, or more. So I think as social movements, as trade unions, uh, it's a historic uh, challenge to rise to this moment, uh, to put aside our differences, whatever they may be, uh, between movements and create a common front to challenge our common enemy and, and build the kind of world we all want. Uh, and if I may, just to end on an example outside of Europe, um, I want to lift up the struggles of Al Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama, in my home country in the United States, who are fighting against impossible odds, difficult, challenging odds in one of the most conservative parts of America uh, to build a union. But they've already won in a way because over 2,000 workers have come together and said they wanted the choice of whether or not to have a union. So, um, you know, I think we should all uh, spend, you know, send our solidarity and support to the workers in Alabama. Uh, I know that our unions are doing all they can to support this struggle. And I know that uh, comrades in Europe are, are eager to support as well and have been. So, um, I just think we all should keep an eye on that. And, you know, Amazon's aggressively trying to bust the union. So, you know, for a European audience where Amazon is bound by certain social conventions uh, in Europe in terms of respecting workers' rights or social dialogue, in America, the gloves are off and Amazon is showing its true colors of, you know, constant propaganda, threatening workers, misinformation, uh, propaganda in the toilets, uh, on the TV screens, everywhere. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's what we're, we're doing all we can to support those workers now, and, and hopefully they're victorious. And again, thanks to Lila uh, for, the kind, for the incredible leadership she's shown in this movement. Merci, Nick. Je confirme la Thank you so much, Nick. Indeed, uh, I went to a warehouse uh, from Amazon just before Christmas, and I can confirm that there is the Amazon's propaganda even uh, in the restrooms. Yeah. You can put your scanner and you have, well, the pro propaganda there. It's unbelievable. Anyone else to take the floor for a final word? Mm. Anyone unmuted? Let's see, just to be sure. Well, I could maybe just uh, say one more thing, although I have already spoken a lot. Uh, I, I'm moved by what's happening here. It's good well, to see that well, Polish workers are expressing themselves, that MEPs are expressing themselves, and it's an opportunity we have here to talk all together. We can feel like it's a challenge but it this challenge can actually help us bounce back better for a brighter future and amazon indeed is maybe a cloud in the sky but at least we are looking at the sky and we can all look at it the same way and i'm enthusiastic for the future and it is indeed important to have all stakeholders working together, workers from warehouses in uh, Poland, ecologists, uh, French uh, MEPs, and US representatives as well. And it will be hard, but we will need to continue the struggle. Thank you ever so much. Anyone else to take the floor for a final well, word? No, no one? Okay, well then, thank you every 
to all of you for these interventions. Indeed, we want to fight even more now that we've heard all of this at our own respective level. You can count on me at the European Parliament. I'll try to do my best to wage this battle within the institution. Thanks to Fronance and uh, Anno for this study, which is a tool, a tool for our battle against this giant Amazon. And please do not hesitate to use it in the different countries and to uh, take all the data which can be useful uh, thanks to the interpreters as well for their uh, work during this seminar. Thank you to you, Madame Shaibi. Thanks to my team, which worked a lot in organizing this meeting. And that's all for me. We will soon see each other again for this battle against Amazon and its world. Uh, with e-commerce and once again i do hope that we'll be able to see each other in flesh and bone as soon as the pandemic is over so that well we can uh, confront amazon europe ceo with amazon's workers within the european parliament then um, if need be you know how, how to reach me so that i can well uh, sent a, a written question to the European Commission so that I can get in touch with other colleagues from other countries as well. That's wh why I'm here. Thank you to all of you for listening to us here or on social media. And um, thanks to all those who follow this meeting on replay. Thank you so much. Bye bye.